Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come expectantly to your word today. We know, Father, that your word is living and active, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces to the vision of bone and marrow, of, of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, Father, I pray that we would realize this is a living word. This is a living word from the one true God. This is a word that is able to make us complete, equipped for every good work. And so, Father, I ask that as we look at your word and as we look at the very sorry example here of Saul and his disobedience, I pray, Father, that this would be like a mirror to our own lives, to our own heart, that we would see the ways in which we can justify our own lack of obedience to you. Pray that this would, this would stir within us a resolve to walk by faith and obedience. And I pray especially this would help us to see our obedient King, Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been told before that there was a ladies' Bible study who was uh, studying the book of Malachi and they're confused about Malachi 3.3, 3, which says this, re referring to God. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And they wondered, what, what does this mean? Well, as it turned out, one of the ladies, she knew a silversmith, and she asked if the class could come and to be able to observe the process. Well, they were watching the craftsman at his work, and the silversmith explained that the crucible that they put the metal into, that it had to be brought up to a temperature exceeding 1,700 degrees. It had to be brought up that high in order to melt the metal, and the metal needed to be kept in the center of the heat at all times. And only then would it purify the silver, and it would reveal what is valuable and what is worthless metal. Well, one of the class members turned to the silversmith and said, how can you know what's valuable, what's silver, and what's worthless? And the silversmith's face lit up. He said, that's easy. When I heat it up and I can see my face in it, then it's silver. But if not, then it's worthless. Well, the fiery crucible is what reveals the metals. It reveals the metals. Would it reflect the refiner's face or not? So also God has lovingly ordained that we would all face various trials, uh, uh, very, very difficult trials, tough trials, and God's purpose in these trials is to reveal what is within us. And his purpose is to refine us so that we might reflect the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That his image would, his face would shine in our own lives. James 1, 2 through 3 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Here we're told that we are to count all joy when we face trials of many kinds, all kinds of trials, all kinds of difficulties. And we need to view them for what they are, which James says, they are a testing of our faith. They are a revealing of what's within us. They are a purifying of us. When we go through all kinds of trials, like health trials, loneliness, temptations, unfulfilled desires, demands from others, being hated for faithfulness to Christ, having too much 
month at the end of your money? Our temptation is simply to view these trials as, as difficulties or, or annoyances or they're just frustrations and we just want them to be over. But God's word says we need to reveal them, we need to see them for what they are, which is their testing of our faith. This is God's crucible uh, revealing what's within us and purifying us. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we see a fiery crucible that God is bringing upon King Saul. Now, you remember for the backdrop here, 1 Samuel, God had given a promise through Hannah, through, in her song, that God had a plan of salvation to redeem his people, to save his people through his anointed king. And Israel, rather than waiting for God to establish a king, a king after God's own heart, they demanded a king, and they wanted a king in God's place. God conceded to their demands and had the prophet Samuel anoint Saul uh, as king. In chapter 11, we see that Saul shows the blueprint of God's saving purposes for the salvation that he'll bring through his king by destroying this evil king that's bent upon, uh, upon uh, hurting the people of God, this king named Nahash, whose name means serpent, and he destroys him. And so we should be thinking, could Saul be this promised one? Could he be this savior? Could he be the Messiah? Could he be the one that God had promised back in Genesis that he would come and crush the head of the serpent? Well, Saul's kingdom is established in Gilgal, and Samuel concludes his exhortation to the people of God and to the king in chapter 12, verse 25. He says, if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. And with that, the kingdom is established. And so in our passage, we see that Saul faces this fiery trial, this fiery crucible in which God is revealing what is within Saul. And sadly, what we see here is that Saul fails. And really, his failure goes from chapter 13 to chapter 15. It's all a story of his failure, and the result is that God rejects him as being king. And, and he, what we learn here is he's not the Messiah. He's not the promised one. We're looking for someone to come. But what we see in this passage is, as this fiery crucible comes and reveals the lack of faith that Saul has, this ought to be a warning for all of us that, that we are called to walk by faith in the midst of trials. We're called to trust God, to walk in obedience to God, no matter how difficult the situation would be. And this also leads us to the faithfulness of Christ. So let's look at this passage and then see what God's word has to teach us uh, in his word. So I want you to see two different parts in this passage. First, I want you to see the fiery crucible testing Saul's faith. Well, our passage, as, as Ray brought out in his reading, it, it begins with a puzzling verse one. And it appears like there are some words in the original Hebrew that are missing. Literally, the Hebrew text in verse one reads, Saul was blank years old when he became king and he reigned, it seems like there's another gap, blank two years over Israel. Now we know from the rest of God's word that Saul reigned longer than two years. That wasn't the length of how long he reigned. We know from Acts 13, 21, that the apostle Paul said there, uh, quote, then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. So Saul reigned for 40 years. Well, what are we to make of this two years? Well, some have suggested uh, the, the two years here, it refers to how long Saul reigned until chapter 13. Two years had passed, and now we come to chapter 13. But it's clear that the more than two years have passed. In chapter 9, verse 2, we read, this is right before he's anointed as king, we read that Saul was a young man, and he's still living at home when he was anointed as king. But now in chapter 13, we read that he is an older man, that he has a son, Jonathan, who's old enough to lead troops into battle. So it appears that the gap between chapter 12 and chapter 13 is at least 10 to 20 years. So what are we to make with verse 1? Well, some have suggested that numbers here are missing, that, that they either they weren't included or they were dropped out uh, over time. And so the NASB translation says this, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign. And it says 30 years because there's, uh, there's some Greek translations of the Hebrew here that have 30 years old. He was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 42 years over Israel. 
And so they'd say, well, when Paul says 40 years, that's just a round number, but he reigned 42 years. Well, I, I lean that's probably what's happening here. That's probably what verse 1 means. But in any case, let's continue on with our story here. In verse 2, we read that Saul chose 3,000 men to be a standing army in Israel, 2,000 under his own jurisdiction and 1,000 under his son Jonathan's jurisdiction. And Jonathan's name means Yahweh has given. Yahweh has given. And what we're going to see over the next several weeks is unlike his father, Jonathan had a strong living faith in Yahweh. He loved the Lord and served him faithfully. Now the Philistines, the enemies off towards the west, uh, they had been flexing their military muscles and had established different garrisons in Israel. These, these, are, they, these were palaces and fortresses in Israel, and their purpose was probably to control trade routes. In verse 3, we read that Jonathan boldly went up to the garrison in Geba and defeated it. And the result, in verse 4, is that Israel became a stench to the Philistines. They, they became odious. They became uh, infuriated at the Israelites for what Jonathan had done. The effect here is essentially, it's throwing a rock at a hornet's nest. And now the Philistines are all stirred up, and they're going to come to war against the Israelites. And so King Saul signals to all of Israel to gather at Gilgal to prepare for battle. And what we see in verses 5 through 8 is we see this fiery trial that comes upon King Saul. See three parts to this trial. The first is this. There was an overwhelming enemy force against Saul. Verse 5 says this. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Haven. So before we look at the, the force here, I want you just to get a lay of the land. And Dusty, if you have the, uh, the PowerPoint here, let's show that. So what we see is that the Israelites here on the map wasn't included in my map. So this is where Saul had been. The Philistines are over here uh, toward the west. I think I said east, but they're, they're toward the west by the coast. They had, there was a, uh, a garrison in Geba, which is about right here. It's a mile away from Michmash. Saul, he called all Israel to gather together at Gilgal right here. And then the Philistines, they came and they camped at Michmash. And these two towns here, Gilgal and Michmash, they're only about 10 or 12 miles apart. So let's now see what, the, what this enemy force is that's arrayed against the Israelites. 30,000 chariots. The Philistines were feared far and wide for their military power, especially these chariots that they had. And just to give you a sense of how overwhelming this would have been for the Israelites, just a couple hundred years earlier, there was a man named Sisera that oppressed the Israelites. And we read there in Judges 4.3 that Sisera had 900 chariots. 900 chariots and he oppressed Israel and made life miserable for them. Well, here, the Philistines, they have about 40 times that many, 30,000 chariots. On top of that, they have 6,000 horsemen. And then they have so many troops that they're without number. It says they're like the grains of sand on the seashore. If you go to the, the beach, you start counting the, the grains of sand there, you'll be there for a long time. That's how many soldiers the Philistines have. Well, what does Israel have? Well, Israel, they have a standing army of 3,000 men, 3,000 men, and then they also have called Israel together at Gilgal to try to muster more troops. But we also read later on in verses 15 through 23, which we're going to look at next week, that, that at this time, the Philistines had been rake, making raids from Michmash into Israel, pillaging and plundering different towns and villages in Israel. And if that's not bad enough, the Philistines had prevented the Israelites from having a blacksmith to keep them from making any more weapons. So swords and spears were scarce in Israel at this time. So this is the kind of opposition that Israel is arrayed against. 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, uh, 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 soldiers without number, and the Israelites have very few men and very few weapons. The second part of this fiery trial is they're crippled with fear. Now we know that morale in an army is very important. If an army is gripped with, 
with fear, with cowardice, they're not going to be victorious in battle. Well, how is Israel's morale? We see they are terrified. In verse 6, we read that many were hiding themselves in caves and holes and rocks and tombs and cisterns. Other Hebrews, they decided to, to cross over the Jordan River and, and flee to Gad and to Gilead. And you see right here, here's the Jordan River. And so they're fleeing across here. This is where the land of Gilead is. And then Gad is down around here. So they're, they're fleeing for their lives. They're saying, we have no hope in battle. Let's just get out of here. And so a lot of them just got out of Dodge. Now, those who did remain with Saul and Gilgal, we read that they followed him trembling, verse 7. And so the whole nation here, just get a picture of this. The whole nation is absolutely gripped with fear. Overwhelming military power right against them. They have very, very few resources, and they are paralyzed with fear with what they see. Matthew Henry says, Never were the people of Israel so faint-hearted, so very cowardly as they were now. To make matters even worse, Saul had a deserting army. Verse 8 says this, Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Well, what is this referring to? Well, this refers back to the prophet Samuel's instructions to Saul back in chapter 10. Right, right before, uh, right after he was anointed as king, we read Samuel give these instructions to Saul. Maybe you might turn back to chapter 10, verse 8. It says, Then go down before me to Gilgal, and before, behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. So the command here that Samuel gives is very clear. Go to Gilgal, wait seven days, and I will come up and I'll offer burnt offerings and peace offerings, and I'm going to give you a word from the Lord what you are to do. Wait until I come. So what does Saul do? He waits one day, two day, three day, four day, five day, six day, seven day, almost through the entirety of the seven days, and Samuel doesn't show up. And what were the men doing that were with Saul? Well, they were fleeing. Verse 8 says they were scattering from him. The longer Saul is waiting here, the smaller his army is getting. And if you look, turn uh, down to page, uh, to verse 15, we read that when Saul numbered the troops with him, there were only 600 men. So he's went from 3,000 down to 600. He had been rallying the people to gather Gilgal to try to get more armies, and now he's down to a fifth of what he had. 600 against this great army before him. So put, put yourself in Saul's shoes. Put, put yourself in his situation. This would be a fiery trial, would it not? You have very few resources. It seems like you're left all alone. It seems like death is absolutely certain. Destruction of maybe the entire Israelite nation. What are you going to do? Well, how does Saul respond? Now we go to our second point, which is the failure of Saul's faith. So when Saul sees that Samuel did not come, he grows impatient and he decides to offer the sacrifices himself. And as soon as he offered up the animal for the burnt offering, read, read this in verse 10, behold, Samuel came. So apparently it was at the end of the seventh day that Samuel has now arrived, like he said he would. And Saul goes out to greet him like nothing's wrong. He said, hey, Samuel, it's good to have you here. Finally arrived. Great, great to have you join us. And Samuel looks at Saul and says, what have you done? Now Saul replies by putting a positive spin on everything he, he, he did. He, he justifies his actions. He says this, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I've not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. I didn't want to, but I forced myself, and I offered the burnt offering. He says, in effect, Samuel, I didn't really have any other choice. Given the situation that I was in, I did what was reasonable. I did what anybody would do. What Saul is saying here is he's saying, this situation here justifies me acting in this way. 
But Samuel, he cuts through all this self-justification. He says this in verse 13. You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. Samuel's saying, it doesn't matter what your situation was or how much sense your actions seem to have made in the moment. That was disobedience to God. Samuel's saying, difficult circumstances never make disobedience okay. Difficult circumstances never make disobedience okay. Well, wh what was the nature of his disobedience? What, what did, what did, how did Saul disobey? Well, some have suggested it was because uh, only priests were authorized to offer up sacrifices. And here he is as a king, and he's offering up these sacrifices, that here he is acting as a priest. He's acting in a way that he's not authorized as a king to act. He's acting like King Uzziah did when he entered into the temple to offer incense on the golden altar. And then God struck him with leprosy because he's acting as a priest when he's not authorized to do that. Well, is that what's going on here? Well, I don't think so. We later read of King David in 2 Samuel 24, 25, and King Solomon in 1 Kings 3, 15, that they also offered up animal sacrifices to God. And there's no hint of rebuke from God upon them. Presumably, David and Solomon offered up their sacrifices through priests. And if you look at chapter 14, chapter 13, 14, 15, they all go together. If you look at chapter 14, verses 40, verse 41, we, we read there that, that Saul, he consulted the Urim and the Thummim. And that is the, the breast piece that the priest had or it's, it's what the priest had to, be able to discern the will of God. So presumably, priests were there. Priests were there, and it seems, we can assume, the priests were the ones who helped Saul offer these sacrifices. So if Saul's sin was not acting as a priest, what, what was it? Saul, Saul's sin was disobeying God's command and not receiving word from God through the prophet Samuel. That was the sin. It was disobeying the word of God and not receiving word from God through the prophet Samuel. Remember what Samuel had said. Wait seven days, I'll offer up the sacrifices, and I will show you what you must do. As God's prophet, Samuel is the bearer of God's word. He would give guidance to Saul for the war that he would have with the Philistines. He'd give instruction. This is what you are to do. This is how you are to engage in battle. But rather than waiting for God's word and acting according to God's word, King Saul proceeded without it. I don't need God's word. I'll just continue headlong without it. If you look back at chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, we read that Samuel had warned Israel and her king that they were to walk in obedience to God's word. Look at verses 14 and 15. Samuel said, If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. This is what we've heard again and again. Israel, but especially her king, they are to be under the authority of God. The king was never intended by God to be ruling in God's place. He was always to be ruling under God, under his word, under his authority, acting as a faithful vice regent and being obedient to all that God's word says and leading the people in righteousness. But here, Saul, as the king, is saying, I don't need God's word. And he's placing himself outside of God's authority and ruling independently. There's one commentator that says this, Saul's act was an act of insubordination a failure to submit to Yahweh's word through his prophet. He's refusing to be a king under the rule of God. He's wanting to be a king on his own, be an autonomous king. Well, what is God's judgment that he brings upon Saul for his sin? Verse 13 says, if he would have been obedient, his kingdom would have been established forever. But verse 14, Samuel says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And we, we see Saul's rejection as king. There's a two-part rejection in 
Chapter 15, there he's officially rejected by God as king. Chapter 13, what's happening is it's his house that's being rejected. It's his dynasty. There, there's not going to be a, a, a Saul dynasty over Israel. God has sought out a man after his own heart, a man who loves him and obeys his word and lives under his authority, and he is going to be the king. And so this passage ends on a terribly sad note. We read in verse 15 that Samuel arises and leaves Gilgal, and Saul goes into battle without guidance from the Lord. So what is it that God is saying to you today from this very sad example of Saul not living under the authority of God's word? Well, there's at least two things. The first thing is, beloved, see how foolish it is to disobey God. See how foolish it is to disobey God. Saul, he didn't think that he had acted foolishly. He thought, given the circumstances, this was the wisest thing for me to do. It, it all makes sense. He thought, given the circumstances, disobeying God here was the only reasonable step to take. And we see this kind of rational, rationalization for disobedience throughout Scripture. Remember back to the time of Moses, that when he went up onto Mount Sinai for those 40 days, that the people of God, when they realized that Moses was gone for a long period of time, they came and approached Aaron to make a, a golden calf and to worship it, and to worship it as if it were God. And when Moses confronts Aaron, what does he say? Well, you're gone such a long time. We didn't know what had become of you. And the, the people pressed me to make this golden calf. So what was I to do? Or you remember the 12 spies sent into the promised land, the land of Canaan? And uh, they, they saw the plenty in the land, but they also saw the giants. And they came back to report to the people of God, and 10 of the 12 spies said, the land is wonderful, this land that God has promised us, but we will never be able to take it because their people are huge. We're like grasshoppers. So let's just turn around. This won't work. Rationalizing our disobedience to God. And if circumstances get challenging enough, you and I can be guilty of the same thing, can't we? We give ourselves to overindulgence, to food or to drink because, because we're lonely or, or we're discouraged or depressed. We get embittered at someone else because of the way that they have mistreated us, not just once, but again and again. And so I have a right to be embittered towards this person. We don't honor the Lord's day and we begin to for, forsake the assembly of ourselves with one another because we have other commitments or we're busy or we just want a day to ourselves. We don't speak up for Christ at work or amongst our family because we're fearful of what the consequences might be and how others might respond to us. We don't lovingly confront someone in sin because we don't want them to hate us. We need to have a relationship with them after all, don't we? We can justify it in many, many ways. It's so easy to rationalize disobedience. We can even be like Saul and believe that we are acting wisely. Given the circumstances, given the pressures I'm facing, this is the best thing for me to do. But beloved, we need to hear again Samuel's words that he said to Saul. He said, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. Beloved, it is always foolish to walk in disobedience no matter our circumstance. It is always foolish to walk in disobedience, no matter our circumstance. It doesn't matter how reasonable our disobedience may seem. It is always foolish to disobey God. Matthew Henry says this, those that disobey the commandments of God do foolishly for themselves. Sin is folly, and sinners are the greatest fools. The Bible talks a lot about the wise and the, and the fools, and it's not, when it speaks of it, it's not talking about intellectual abilities in the first place at all. It's talking about moral issues. It's talking about our approach to God. We, we remember last week, we talked about uh, what, is the, what is the beginning of wisdom? It's the fear of the Lord, having a reverence for God, having a right view of God and living in light of that. Well, on the other hand, living foolishly is not viewing God in mind, not living before the face of God. Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So they don't live to try to please God. They don't give thought to what would honor God. They don't give thought to glorifying God in their lives. They give thought to what's going to work out well. How will life be easy for me? What's going to work out the best situation here? 
God's commandments weigh lightly on this person. And no matter how we rationalize it, we need to realize that our if our circumstances lead us to disobey God, then we are acting foolishly. So when we're in a fiery situation, when we're in a tough trial, instead of asking, uh, what makes the most sense for me to do? We need to ask, what does God call me to do in this circumstance? Remember, your circumstances are ordained of God, and they are a testing of your faith. They are a fiery crucible to reveal what's within you and to purify you. Just like that silversmith is purifying that metal to make it pure silver, to make it valuable, that's what God is doing in your life when you face hardships. God's design is that you might walk in faith and obedience in those difficult trials so that you might reflect the image of your Savior in your life. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we remember that we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by what our circumstances are, by what our trial is, by, by what seems to make the most sense given the hard, hard things that are pressing in on me. We walk by, by faith, according to what God has promised, according to what God has said. So see the foolishness of disobedience to God. And secondly, see the perfect obedience of King Jesus all for your salvation. So as we see the first king of Israel fail in God's calling for him to be a vice regent over the people of God, this should make you look to the faithfulness of King Jesus, the one who is obedient all the way to the point of death. Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is the promised king. He is the son of David who has come to bring salvation for his people. And unlike Saul, Jesus always lived in perfect obedience to his father. John 6, 38 says this, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's what Jesus said. Look, look at the humility and the, um, the, the faithfulness, the commitment that Jesus had to the word of God and to obey him. I have not come down to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And it didn't matter how hard or trying the circumstances were, Jesus always lived according to God's word and did the will of his Father. You remember in Matthew 4 when he was led out into the wilderness and was tested uh, and, 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 and fasted for 40 days. There he was weary and was tempted to doubt God's goodness. And the, the devil came to tempt him. And at first he tempted him to be self-reliant and to turn stones into bread. And what did Jesus do? He lived by faith in God's word, and he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the temple, and he told him to, uh, to jump off the temple, and God's angels would, would protect him, would catch him. But what did Jesus do? He lived by the word of God. And he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the devil showed him all the, the, the nations of the world and all their glory. He said, so Jesus, I'll give you all these nations, all their glory. You can bypass the cross if you'll just bow down and worship me. And what did Jesus do? He lived according to the word of God. And he said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. This fiery crucible that our Lord was in in the wilderness and throughout his entire time here on earth. And what did he do? He was faithful. He was obedient. He lived according to the word of God. Never walking by sight, always walking by faith, even to the point of pouring out his life on the cross. And there our Lord suffered in the place of sinners, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God for all who repent and believe in him. And because of his obedience, God has exalted Jesus at his right hand, at the highest place of authority and power. Seated him there, he has exalted him forever as his vice regent to reign over all things until every enemy is subdued under his feet. So when we see the, the faithlessness of Saul, this should make us uh, go in a beeline to our Lord Jesus Christ and be amazed at his faithfulness. And, and beloved, Jesus' perfect obedience is necessary for your salvation. He needed to be a perfect sacrifice for your sins. For our failure to live under God's word, he did this to forgive you, he did this to cleanse you, and to make you zealous to live in obedience to God. 
So look at your obedient king. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his great love for you and take heart in his salvation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you as we consider our own lives and we consider the ways in which we have been like Saul. And we have, we have walked in disobedience to you. We sought to rationalize it every which way. We confess, Father, that we are sinners and we do need a Savior. We do need forgiveness. We do need reconciliation with you. And we are thankful that Jesus Christ is the obedient one. For Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Father in heaven, I pray that if there's any here that they have not turned to the righteous one and put their faith in him for his work of salvation, that they can receive forgiveness and cleansing and reconciliation with you. Father, I pray that they would do that today. And Father, I pray for all of us that we would be amazed at the faithfulness of Christ, that he was faithful unto death out of love for us. So, Father, we praise Christ and we lift him up. And, Father, I pray that as we consider what Christ has done, that we would have a renewed commitment to live in obedience to him. We praise in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.